Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Jake. Can we, can we welcome Pastor Jake to the team? He's a phenomenal guy. He's got a big heart for students. He's super excited to be here. And uh, he and his wife just moved to my hometown, Kingsburg. Yeah, there's only two of us. We're all, everyone's like, Kingsburg? Kingsburg is awesome, okay? Anyway, good to be here this morning. My name's Jeff. Uh, so I lead our creative team anymore, right? Um, we're not exactly sure who is and who isn't Bridge Church after a year of weirdness, right? So if you're with us on our online campus or here in the room and you have no idea who I am, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm Jeff, and I've been on staff here for about 15 years. I lead our creative team, music, technology, visuals, things like that. And occasionally, Pastor Andrew lets me out the cage, and I get to share from the Bible. And so this is one of those weeks uh, Pastor Andrew and his family are, are enjoying some time away, some much-earned time away together. So as, as they come into your heart and your mind, pray for them for a good time, for safety, uh, rejuvenation, renewal, things like that. Uh, we certainly love Pastor Andrew around here, and let's, let's lift he and his family up in prayer. Um, you know, I, uh, I preached last year on Sunday, March 8, one year ago today, and uh, someone's clapping. <laughs> it, I was the last person to stand up here and preach uh, in person uh, on our Ashland campus before everything went, and we, uh, we had to closed down for a while, and I was just reflecting on, I was reflecting on that in relation to this series, like the, the title of the series, right, it, you, you could read it, it's not supposed to be this way, but really it's, it's not supposed to be this way, because that's how we feel, right, about a lot of things in life for a long time now, and uh, I was reflecting on the fact that, man, none of us expected what we've endured, those of us who are uh, online this morning, because we have to be, we didn't expect that. Some of us are choosing to be online, and that's totally okay. Uh, we didn't expect to be messed with financially. We didn't expect to have our relationships deeply affected by this, this season. We didn't expect to have to, like, oh, wear masks. Like, I'm totally glad I can see your eyeballs here, but it's so strange, right? We just, we didn't expect, it's not supposed to be this way, and I was... I was reflecting on that and, and coming full circle after, after a year, getting to, just by luck of the draw, right, stand here and open up the Bible again. One year later to the Sunday, I was like, man, God's been faithful. It's been difficult, but God's been faithful all the way through. And this morning, if, if we hear nothing else uh, from God's word, from the Bible, if you hear nothing else, hear that through a year where over and over and over again, we all have said it wasn't supposed to be that way, and some of us are still living in that reality this morning, hear that you are loved well. God loves you well, and he proves it in Jesus, and he continues to give you Jesus, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So pray with me as we, as we dive into the Bible here. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you that, yes, it is not supposed to be this way, but nothing is of a surprise to you. You've been faithful. You're, you're still faithful, God. You are, you are reworking and reforming our lives with you. You are working and, and reforming this church, what it means to be church, to attend church, to live church, to do church. You're, you're reforming that we're living in such a unique time in history. May we be faithful in return. May we love God like you have loved us. It's so hard in so many ways to do that right now, but we're asking this morning that you would teach us more about that and help us to love well, Jesus, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. So uh, grab, grab a Bible or device, which, whichever you prefer. It doesn't matter. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Four. Now, of course, if you're with us on the online campus, you'll be able to see this on the screen for the rest of you here in the room. Grab a Bible or device, First Peter chapter 4. Uh, last week, we were in chapter 3, right? And, and Pastor Andrew talked about the reality uh, that we are to choose as followers of Jesus. When we're given the options, uh, we are choose to bless. We are choosing to bless people. And uh, we have to allow ourselves to be filled up and blessed by God so that we are able then to pull from our own shopping cart. He had that big red shopping cart on stage, right? And bless others from what God has given us. And if our cart is empty, we have nothing with which to bless. And so 
as the, as the Jesus people here on earth, we choose to bless. And, and today, we're going to jump into chapter 4, and, and this comes next, and this is what it says. The end of all things is near. This is verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength that God provides so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him, Jesus, be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So jumping right out the gate here, there's a bunch of stuff to drill down into in, the, in this little set of verses, all right? So track with me this morning. We've got a lot to drill down into. And the first thing is this, our relationship with God, this is so challenging, but it's so true, and we're going to see that this morning. Our relationship with God is either built up or blocked by our level of self-control. <laughs> Ah, I think some of us probably at home or in the room this morning are, are feeling pretty convicted about that statement alone. Like, I haven't even gotten there to talk about how the Bible explains that. Uh, like, when the Lord gave that to me this week, he gave it for me. He was talking to me through the text about my own level of self-control in some critical areas of life. And he's like, oh, by the way, you should probably share that too. Friends, our, our relationship with God is either blocked or built up by our level of self-control. Verse 7 says this, the end of all things is near. So that's, that's kind of like a, a downer, right? Oh, the end of all things is near. Now, remember the context here in 1 Peter. We had struggling new Christians who somehow had gotten some, some theology mix-up going on in their lives and in their hearts, and they expected that when they gave their lives to Jesus, Jesus came into their lives, that things would just get better. They would get easier, that the hiccups would be less frequent, that the difficulties would be less poignant. And in fact, what they discovered was things were even more difficult after Jesus was in control of their lives. And their response collectively was, what is going on? Is not supposed to be this way? What's, what's about the blessing of God in our lives, the peace of God in our lives? And that's the context here. And so a statement like, the end of all things is near is a word of encouragement from the pastoral heart of the Apostle Paul. The person, the human person through whom God is writing, or excuse me, Peter, the human person through whom God is writing this is offering a word of encouragement that there, there will be an end. Today, the end of the difficulty is nearer now than it was yesterday. Amen? In our lives, the end of the difficulty is nearer now today than it was yesterday. Man, that'll preach in every single area of our life, every relationship, every finance, every parenting thing, every job-related thing. The difficulty, the end of it is nearer now than it was yesterday because God is eventually going to set everything right. So the end is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. That for prayer part is so important. See, uh, other places in the New Testament we find that phrase, be alert and sober-minded. Like perhaps the most famous one is in James, the book of James, right? Where uh, James is saying, be alert and sober-minded because your enemy, the devil, this imagery, I love it, but it, it's just so poignant. Your enemy, the devil, is prowling around. He's on the hunt like a lion, ready to kill, looking for someone to devour. And so the, the word of caution there in that setting is, be alert, be sober-minded that things aren't always as they seem and that everything just doesn't always turn out right because there is an enemy who's working against us. So we find this phrase here, but there's an important addition. Be alert and sober-minded for what? Not in a general sense this time, in a hyper-specific sense. Be alert and sober-minded for prayer. So, so what's up with that? Why, why would he say that? What, what does this have to do with our relationship with God, our level of self-control? Friends, prayer is our primary relational connection to God. Prayer is our primary relational connection to God. The Bible is our primary intellectual connection. And sometimes new and fascinating and creative things come out of the Bible. But relationship with God does not come out of the Bible. 
The Bible teaches us how to, how to live, how to walk the way in which we should go. It reveals God's heart to us and, and shows us Jesus, but it is prayer, it is conversation, it is walking with Jesus along the way. Prayer in the Bible encompasses all of these things. It's not just that time when we sit down by ourselves, you know, like fold our hands and close our eyes and pray. It, it is a walking with God in the direction God is going through Jesus Christ. Prayer is our primary point of connection for that reality. So it says, be alert and, and sober-minded for prayer. And, and, and we see Jesus living into this reality, right? All over the New Testament and the Gospels, like six or seven different times, we find this statement, Jesus withdrew to lonely places to pray with the Father. He was God. Why would he need to do that? Why would God in the flesh need to withdraw to talk to God not in the flesh? Because in his humanity, being both God and human, he needed the relational connection. Jesus knew all the answers, like he knew the Bible and it hadn't even been written yet. He needed the relational connection. And so he withdrew and he prayed and he maintained that and we find it all over as he's traveling around journeying, teaching about the kingdom of God and how it's breaking into this broken world and into the lives of people who experience brokenness here. And that's why we find in 1 Thessalonians a, a, a simple command, pray constantly. It's not saying like close your door and sit down and, and, and close your eyes and Present your laundry list and then, and then wait and then confess and all of those things are important. The idea here, pray constantly, is walk in the direction God is already going with him along the way through Jesus Christ. Be with him relationally, constantly. Prayer is that connection. And so we're to be alert. Because friends, when we're in difficulty, when we're in situations where we can say it's not supposed to be this way, why is it like this? One of the first things that's affected by that often is our prayer life, our relationship with God, our relational connection to God. We are influenced by the difficulty. We are influenced by the challenge. We are influenced by our circumstances. And so it says alert. The idea of here of being alert for prayer is that we would not just live with wisdom, yes, but here it is, the critical thing, that we would exercise self-control over our passions and our desires. That's what alert means here in the biblical context. For prayer, for the sake of prayer, exercise self-control over your passions and your desires. Then it says sober-minded. Uh, that, that takes this imagery of self-control and extends it even further. Uh, the idea of keeping in check the controlling influence of emotions. It, it's not just saying now, yes, Let's, let's live, let's have self-control over our emotions, our passions, desires. But it acknowledges now that those things can often influence a control in our lives that we wish wasn't there, but we don't know how to fix. We're controlled by them, whether we realize it or not. Those, those emotions, those passions, desires, and this idea of being sober-minded for the sake of prayer is that we would keep those things in check. We would, we would notice their controlling influence, and we would say, no, why is that? Because the less self-control we have, the more we're tossed about by unhealthy emotions, emotions are fine, there's nothing unhealthy about emotions. The more we are tossed around by unhealthy emotions, the more we are influenced by unhealthy desires, the more we allow our passions that don't have any alignment with God's word and ways to run wild and free, the more our prayer life is blocked and thus the more our relationship with God is blocked. Have you ever been in a situation where you got a lack of self-control going on in an area in your heart and in your head and in your life and it's just so excruciatingly difficult to connect with God? And sometimes we can't even put our finger on it this is it, friends. Our relationship with God is dramatically influenced. It's either built up or blocked by our level of self-control. The, the controlling influence of unhealthy desire, unhealthy emotion, unhealthy passion, what, what is it doing in our life? It works like this. Imagine that this, imagine that this flashlight, this beam, is our relationship with God. You can see it there in the room, and you can see it there on our online campus. See, when we are exercising control, the, 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 the unhealthy emotions and desires we have in our relationships that want to control us, but instead we are controlling them, our relationship with God, it gets a little brighter. It gets a little stronger. Our connection grows a little bit. In those areas, those, those areas of sensuality, physical emotions, physical desires, things that would seek to derail us from the way that God has designed humanity to relate to one another sexually, 
when we control those things for the sake of God, our connection grows a little stronger. When we rein in our finances and use them for God's kingdom and glory rather than letting them run however we want with any instant gratification or desire, it grows. But the opposite is true, friends. Maybe we're drinking a little, a little too frequently and there's, there's something that's just like blocking, blocking our relationship with God. And all of a sudden we, like, prayer, what happened, what happened to prayer? Like I'm, I'm dialing on the phone and I feel like I forgot the number and where, why isn't God answering? And, or maybe it's anger, man. Maybe there's a circumstance in my life. It is not supposed to be this way and I'm just, I'm anger it is unhealthy and it's bubbling up and, I, and I'm not controlling and I'm exercising no self-control over my anger. And it gets... It's a little dimmer. Our connection to God is is blocked by that. We add in relationships. (laughs) We add in difficulty itself. We add in fear. We add in you name it. Be alert and sober-minded. Because when we're not, Our relationship with God is blocked. And friends, when we are in the middle of a situation that is not supposed to be this way, we have determined that, "Ah, I don't like it. This is not what I believe God's life for me is supposed to be about. Our choice is this or this. And friends, God has given us the control over this. Not the circumstances, but our response to them. Will we be alert Sober-minded for the sake of prayer. Because a lack of self-control, man, it, it blocks our prayer life. We know this from experience, and the Bible's teaching it here. And that's what blocks our relationship with God. Friends, reading the Bible, it's not enough. It's dry and empty and hollow without the Holy Spirit coming into our lives and without that connection through God relationally. So I want to uh, ask this morning, I want to ask you to consider... Does God seem distant right now, right now, right now in your home with you this morning, whoever's watching right now in our Ashland campus, uh, if you're with us out on the plaza this morning, does God seem distant? Is it difficult to pray? Is the experience, here it is, those of us who are wired up to be sin saints, this is very important, and it's often not talked about in the church, is the experience of prayer unfulfilling? If, if, if there's a, a resounding yes or even kind of like a residual marginal yes to answer any of those questions, friends, that means there is a self-control issue somewhere in your life. It means there's a self-control. There's an area in which uh, you're not being as alert and as sober-minded as you could be, and it's, and it's blocking things rather than building them up in your relationship with God. And so it can be difficult sometimes, right? Self-control issues can be sneaky. Like there's the big ones that have to do with like our relationships, uh, finances, our our, you know, sexuality, the, the things that we do online, and, and maybe our integrity at work, or, or drinking, or smoking, or any of those things. And then there's the little self-control issues that really only God and us know a whole lot about because they're unique to how we're wired up, and they often live at the surface of character, who we are when no one else gets to see. At that level, friends, here, here it, can be, it can be difficult to identify, like, where, what is going on? Where is the self-control? Here's the question we need to ask. Is there a tension that deserves my attention? I love that phrase. It comes from Pastor Andy Stanley. And man, it just, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks when I first heard it a few months back. I was like, oh yes, that is so helpful, friends, in your life, as you're considering your life and where, where there, it might be an area where there needs to be more self-control. Ask yourself, when I'm making that decision, when I am connecting with that relationship, when I am doing that thing, when I am attending in that way at work, when I am looking at that thing, when I'm allowing my heart to travel in that direction, my thought life to go down that road, is there a tension there in that moment with that decision? Is there a tension that deserves my attention? And that is your answer. That's the area to drill down into. That's the area that needs more alertness, more sober-mindedness, because that is the area that very likely is messing with your prayer life and messing with your relationship with God. Friends, there can be no intimacy with God without intimacy in prayer. It is a relational connection to God, and it either builds up or blocks. 
So I want to I encourage you into community. One of our values here at Bridge Church is community. We, friends, we believe we are better together because God wired us up to be together and not be alone. That is one of the primary reasons this past year with all the sheltering in place and quarantining and blah, 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 blah and all those things, right, has been so difficult because we've been more alone than God desires us to be. So if you're, if you're in a spot where you don't have a tribe, you need a tribe. Sign up for a group. Open up our app. Head to bridgechurchfresno.com, walk outside uh, and head over to the cafe right there, find Pastor Nick or any of his team that have a big blue hello shirt on and say, I want to be in a group. And they'll help you right then and there. Friends, our relationship with God is either built up or blocked by our level of self-control, right? And in situations where it's not supposed to be this way, man, self-control can be a real challenge. What else? Let's read on. Let's read verses 8 to 11. It says, above all, maintain constant love for one another. (laughs) As if self-control wasn't hard enough. Maintain constant love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. (laughs) It just gets better and better, right? Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, let that person speak with God's own words. If they serve, let it be from the strength God provides them so that God may be glorified in all of this through Jesus Christ. Friends, the bottom line is this. Above all, love well. Oh, man. Above all, love well. (laughs) I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible and there are two things crammed together that don't seem to have an obvious connection to one another, I'm like, okay, what what is the connecting point here? And when I read this, I was like, all right, so we're talking about self-control, remaining alert and sober-minded so that our relationship with God isn't blocked and all messed up. Oh, by the way, love constantly because love covers a multitude of sins. Friends, prayer, our relationship with God has to come first. Our relationship with God has to come first. Without it, we cannot love well. We can't live into this passage if we're not being loved well. Here it is. To love well above all else, we must be loved well above all else. (laughs) To love well above all else, we must be loved well above all else. Here it is. Here it is. This is what this passage is teaching. It's this simple. The love of God, our lives. We have to allow ourselves to be poured into unconditionally, daily, without fear, without shame, without regret, without doubt, without, but God, I'm so daily. We must be loved well if we are to love well, if we are to maintain constant love no matter what, as this passage calls us. When things are difficult, when it is not supposed to be this way, the the bottom line, the ultimate reality is you must love. The more difficult it gets, the more you pour yourself out in love, especially to the people you don't like. But we can't do that if we've got nothing to pour out. If we're going to pour into the lives of others, We must be loved well. And there it is, our relationship with God, self-control, so that it's built up and not blocked, so that we might be poured into by God, so that we might be able to, above all else, love well. Let's drill down into this. It says constant, maintain constant love for one another. <clears throat> I'm not a naturally loving person. It's full disclosure. Like, it, it's difficult for me. I don't empathize well. I don't naturally have compassion. Uh, <laughs> right? If it weren't for the Holy Spirit growing the fruit of the Spirit inside of me, I probably wouldn't naturally have any of these things. Um, and that's a part about myself that I'm like, man, I don't, I don't like that. But God... But God, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But God poured his Holy Spirit into me, and I'm learning those things. But God, right? He says, above all, love well. And and I I read that, and I'm like, man, that just seems like a boat load of work. (laughs) What do we do with that? 
What does it look like to love well? Like it, it's one thing to read the Bible, and so much of the New Testament is, is so interesting or compelling, and some of it is just really beautiful language with, with pretty pictures and imagery. Listen, I mean, listen to this. Above all, maintain constant love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Okay. That's really hard. And what does it look like? The idea that we would love constantly means that we would, our love would, um, it would be marked by care and persistent effort. That's what that word there means in the original language. Love with care and persistent effort. Imagine, friends, every relationship in your life, close your eyes, whether you're on our online campus, here in the room, or out on the plaza, humor me for just a moment and close your eyes. Imagine every relationship, every interaction, Every word you speak today, every decision you make this week, every dollar you spend, every allocation of time on your preciously scheduled calendar, hallelujah, I have one of those, every thought we think, every prayer we pray, all of them marked by care and persistent effort. This is such a beautiful concept. What happens when we do that? You can open your eyes if you were humoring me. (laughs) We discover that love is stronger than sin. (laughs) I'm so thankful for this because, man, I'm a real piece of work. Like, I've been walking with Jesus my entire life And I continue to find rough edges on spots that I thought were not. And people continue to tell me and point out those things in my life, and ultimately I'm thankful for it. (laughs) But we discover that love covers a multitude of sins. Love is stronger than sins. Friends, Jesus is the ultimate example of what it looks like to love well, uh, to live with a love marked by care and persistent effort. God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners and still sinning, Jesus Christ died for us. While you were still sinning, this morning when you woke up and you sinned that sin, whatever it was, Jesus was right there saying, I got it. Today, when you leave this place and you talk about all the crazy things Pastor Jeff said and you get all riled up at the two or three that you didn't agree with and your heart moves into, you know, anger or whatever, Jesus is there too because love is stronger than sin. And Jesus is the example of that. And 1 Peter 3 says this, this is how we have come to know love. Pastor Andrew talked about this a couple weeks ago. That Jesus laid down his life for us, and we should also, here it is, we should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Friends, love is stronger than sin. Above all, uh, love well when we, when we love marked by care and persistent effort, especially amid seasons that are not supposed to be this way. When it's easier to hate, when it's easier to yell, when it's easier to react, when it's easier to binge drink or binge spin or binge watch or binge neglect your kids or binge sleep or all the things that we're prone to doing to cope with the ridiculous reality of life, to live a life of love marked by care and persistent effort, we discover that the sin that plagues us and the sin that plagues our relationships and the sin that plagues our culture and the sin that plagues the world and the sin that even plagues Bridge Church is covered by love, because love is stronger than sin. Love marked by care and persistent effort. What does that look like? Let's round out our time together here in the Bible this morning, looking at a few examples of what that looks like. Verse 9 says, be hospitable to one another without complaining. So we have this beautiful and grand statement. Above all, love well. Maintain constant love for one another. Okay, what does it look like? First thing is this. Loving well is extending hospitality to all without complaining. Oh, that's so hard, right? Now, when we think of hospitality, uh, we have a very particular understanding of hospitality that really has to do with, like, inviting people into our houses 
and uh, making them our guests and serving them a good dinner and making sure everything in the house is just right and the right music's on and we talk about the right things and we give them, like we roll out the red carpet, we give them the, the A-list experience uh, of our lives that we are capable of giving them. Like that's hospitality, extend hospitality, but that is such a narrow, tiny view into what is actually being said here in the Bible concerning hospitality. In the ancient world, the ancient Israelite culture in which uh, this is coming out of as we move into New Testament times and the life of Jesus. Hospitality is a moral compass by which the church lives. It's not dinner and houses, though it can be. It is a moral pillar upon which the church is founded that we would love well in every interaction, that we would love well in every relationship and every opportunity. We would live lives marked by care and persistent effort concerning the other and the love we extend to them. That is what hospitality is. Every time you find in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, there are these phrases, the good, do all things for the good, or things must be done for the good, or he did this with the good in mind. Whenever you encounter that, friends, the picture of hospitality is behind that statement. Love marked by care and persistent effort. That is the good. That is what it means to extend hospitality. Arthur Sutherland, who's a Bible scholar, said this, and I thought he summed it up really well. He says, hospitality is the intentional, responsible, and caring act of welcoming or visiting, either in public or private places, everywhere you go, right? Those who are, listen to this, friends, listen to this. Those who are strangers, enemies, or distressed without regard for reciprocation. Today's culture teaches us to care for and to pour persistent effort into those that we handpick to be worthy of that level of love in our lives. Guard yourself because you'll get burned. Stay away from people that disagree with you because it's frustrating. Don't waste your time and your money on people who won't give you something in return. Avoid those who see things differently because that just never ends well. This is what we are taught by the world in which we live right now. Loving well is extending hospitality to all without claim, complaining about it, especially those who are strangers to us, especially those with whom we disagree, even poignantly. Those who are different than us, those that we don't like, and friends, to be hospitable, that word in the original language, I'm going I'm to geek out on you here for a second. There's two words that have been crammed into one, philos, which is the love of affection, and xenos, the word for stranger. The word here, hospitable, in the New Testament is philazenos, affectionately love the stranger. Without complaining, without expecting anything in return. When things are difficult, when we're freaking out, when we're crying out, when it's not supposed to be this way, above all, the answer to this, the answer to this, to per persevering and, and persisting through difficulty until such a time as the difficulty is removed by God himself or it just dissipates on its own. Whatever God chooses to allow we live lives marked by love, care, persistent effort, extending hospitality, especially to those that anger us, that are different from us, that we don't know, and even people who are after us for what we believe. We love them with care and persistent effort. And in the middle of things that are not supposed to be this way, this is the one thing that God says we can do, love well, that makes things supposed to be this way. We take the situation that's been handed to us and say, this is total garbage. It is not supposed to be like this. And God says, above all else, maintain constant love because love beats sin. And we're prone to sin in difficulty. And in the middle of difficulty, if we choose to live lives marked by care, persistent effort, hospitality, we will win against the difficulty. Regardless of how hard it is. Loving well is extending hospitality to everybody without complaining about the fact that they didn't give it back to us. I'm going to invite our music team to come out now. We're going to transition a little bit here. and It's one thing to hear the Bible, right? 
It's so beautiful and so challenging to hear the word spoken, to allow it to enter our hearts and our lives. It's another to, to live into it physically and tangibly in a moment. Jesus is the ultimate example of what it looks like to love well above all else. God saw, <laughs> you think about, God saw the mess we made. God designed life. This is the story of the Old Testament. God designed a life, created, chose a people, created a place, gave them boundaries for their thriving, and at every juncture along the way, they said, nah, we're just gonna do it ourselves. And it messed everything up. And God saw it. You know what his response was? It's not supposed to be this way. This is never what I had in mind. So Jesus. So Jesus. He sends Jesus. And Jesus says, yes, I will go. He leaves perfection, whatever it looks like. He's hanging out with God, right? And he leaves that to come to the epitome of it's not supposed to be this way. Filth, disgusting, sin, anger, mismanaged life, relationships, murder, death, despair, sadness, brokenness at every level and sphere of life. And Jesus says, yeah, 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 I'll go, I'll go. And he lived a life, man, he was reviled. You read the New Testament, especially the Gospels, and you see that Jesus was hated. He was religiously outside of the bounds. He was politically, mm, he caused strife. He took everything about how the way we wanted it and we had built it, the thing that, that caused it not to be this supposed to be this way, our, our sin and our foolishness, and the thing we had built for ourselves that was just so gross and difficult, and he walked right into the middle of it when it would have been easy to snap his fingers and to cause it all to go away. Instead, he stepped right into the middle of the situation we created. And he lived a life marked by care and persistent effort especially so in the direction of people who hated him, strangers, people with whom he disagreed and who would love nothing more than to see him go away or dead. He stepped right into that space and he loved well. And friends, as believers in the Christian church, we have a practice we call the Lord's Supper, communion, Jesus' dinner table. <laughs> it's called lots of things. And it's an act of remembering that above all else, Jesus loved well. And so if you're with us online, make sure, we're gonna sing a little bit here in a minute. Make sure you head over to your kitchen and you grab something, juice and bread, whatever it is. If you're here in the room and you don't have one of those prepackaged pieces of juice and bread as we sing, please get up and, and head to the back there and grab one now. And uh, we're going to celebrate. We're going to remember together. Worship team, why don't you come out here and, and, and lead us. And friends, this song, this song is intentional. It talks about the hope we have in Jesus. And so as we sing this, consider, consider. Towards 
through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great? Such boundless grace, the God of ages, step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. So Jesus was having dinner with his, his besties. <laughs> it was the last night for him on earth. He was about to fulfill what God had asked him to do, to love well, to, to live a life marked by care and persistent effort. And they're sitting there having dinner and they're, they've, got, they've got things in front of them that, that are common to dinner. And, and at this point, Jesus has lived without sin. <laughs> He's lived without sin, positioning himself to be the only way that God could remove sin from those who would trust in him. A perfect sacrifice. The Bible teaches us that there's got to be consequences. There's got to be shed blood because the, the penalty for sin is death. Like that's the reality of living, taking what God has given and saying, no thanks, I'll do it on my own. It only leads to death. And the only way to overcome that would be for someone to be able to do it just right the way God said it had to be done, and that was Jesus. And so the ultimate way that he lived well, that he lived a life marked by care, persistent effort, was through the sacrifice of himself for us. The situation that he stepped into is not supposed to be that way. And he flipped it all upside down and on its head, and he fixed it. At this dinner, Jesus says, hey, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends, and, and you are my friends if you live the way I have commanded you, if you live the way I have instructed you to live. And I no, I no longer call you servants, I, I call you friends. You didn't choose me, Jesus says, I chose you. You need to hear that this morning, follower of Jesus. He chose you. He saw you. He sees you. He had you in mind, and you're still in his mind. You're lodged deeply in the heart of Jesus. And this morning, as we remember, what we remember is that it would be so easy, man, to not be loved well, right? How, I mean, really, how lovable are we? <laughs> and Jesus says, I'll go all the way for that. And so he took a piece of bread. It was just sitting in front of him at the dinner table like it, like it was at every dinner table, and he broke it and he said, my body, this part, the sacrifice, it's gonna get broken, perfection broken to cover the consequence of sin for you. And he said, do this, remember, remember this. Every time you eat and drink, do this so that you might remember that I loved well and your call is to love well. So friends, let's remember. Let's remember, take your bread and and eat that if you haven't yet. And in so doing, what you're saying is, Jesus, I remember you. I remember that you loved well and you loved me well, and so that gives me the ability to love well. 
Jesus spoke some more, some of the gospels teach us, and then toward the end, he grabbed a cup. He said, this is a new covenant. This is going to be my blood. It's going to get spilled out for you. Everything that has defined your relationship with God, the old covenant, the old way, the old contract, God set out guidelines for you thriving, and you spit them back in his face at every juncture along the journey. And it caused it caused it to be really terrible. Life was really terrible. He said, I'm going to go ahead and spill my blood for you. And in so doing, I'm going to draft a new covenant. We're going to make a new contract. We're going to reestablish a relationship based not on guidelines, but on the fact that I am love. And so he took the cup and he said, as often as you're here, as often as you're eating and drinking, do this to remember my love for you and that it makes possible your ability to love well above all else. Friends, let's remember. Communion, to be sure, is about remembering, but it's also about renewing. (laughs) Renewing our resolve to love well, to extend hospitality without complaint, to extend care and persistent effort into the lives of those, not just that we love, that are easy, but the ones that make our lives difficult, the ones that take our lives as we have fashioned them, mess them all up and make it not supposed to be this way. Those folks, because we are those folks to others. We're all there in different ways. Lives marked by care, persistent effort, hospitality, a lack of complaint, friends. The best thing we can do in a situation that is not supposed to be this way is to live the Jesus way. So whether you're at home or out on the plaza or here in this room, I'd invite you to stand up. We're going to culminate our gathering this morning with worship, acknowledging that Jesus is the living hope, and we are brought into that hope through his love for us.